Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kevin Albert. I'm the Community Resource Officer for the Paradise Valley Police Department. Uh, the first guest I'd like to introduce is Police Chief John Benton. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's, uh, it's really a good showing tonight. I guess our social media and website is working. At least we got the word out. But thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to discuss tonight a uh, problem that is really community-wide, not just in one area. But before I get started, I want to introduce uh, Vice Mayor Michael Collins, who's here. <laughs> Council Member Paul Kembo is somewhere. There he is. <laughs> and Council Member David Scher. So they're here. Obviously, they're, they're concerned with the problem, too. And uh, so we're going to, uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Kevin because we have some uh, distinguished guests that are going to be doing the program for you tonight. So, Kevin. Thank you, Chief. Uh, from Arizona Game and Fish, I'd like to introduce uh, Darren Julian, who's the Urban Wildlife Specialist, and Officer Curtis Herbert, who's the Wildlife Manager. Okay, well, good evening. Thank everyone for being here. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to speak to 50-some people all at once than to get 50 phone calls. So I, I appreciate the uh, time that you've taken to come and learn a little bit about urban wildlife and, and specifically coyotes. Um, so we'll just kind of jump right in. Um, the presentation is kind of living with Arizona's wildlife. Um, we're going to talk about um, some of the common urban wildlife uh, with the emphasis on coyotes tonight. Uh, talk about what their needs are, uh, why they're in your neighborhood to begin with, and then talk about some of this uh, human wildlife conflict resolution. Uh, we're talking about eliminating some of the things that they're attracted to, um, changing some of the things that we do to attract them, um, and then kind of a getting uh, as a community effort uh, cooperation and some taking some responsibility if we are the problem when we're dealing with wildlife. Okay, <clears throat> so people ask, you know. Well, we live in a city, and Paradise Valley is kind of dead center. You know, you're not, not on a fringe anymore, not not near, um, you know, deserts. Although both sides or several sides of you do have some remnant uh, desert uh, areas, but you know, people always ask why why is there wildlife in my neighborhood? Um, well, you know, long ago when there was nothing out here, uh, there really wasn't that many coyotes either. Okay. <laughs> So, but when we, when we uh, bladed the area, developed it and stuff, though, the animals that could move and do move, they actually move out temporarily. When you create a nice uh, environment for us to live in, those animals see that because they're probably just on the fringe of development at that point, and then they move back in. Um, so uh, for a lot of animals, uh, life is certainly easier, easier in the, the city or in your neighborhood as opposed to living in a harsh desert climate, okay? Um, and then certainly for some animals, usually the ones that uh, are more what we call a generalist, okay, the animals that eat a variety of things, we certainly have higher concentrations of those animals uh, within an urban community, okay, for example, coyotes, bunny rabbits, things like that. Okay, uh, some of the things that these animals are attracted to, and basically it all comes down to habitat. That's what these animals need to thrive and survive. Uh, basically food, water, cover, and depending on the type of animal, what that arrangement of space is, okay? Golf courses uh, in a lot, for a lot of these critters provide habitat uh, just in itself, okay? But water sources can be pools or bird baths, uh, sprinklers, fountains, you name it, okay? And some of the food sources can be pet food that's left out. Uh, and for some of these predators like coyotes, bobcats, uh, can be pe uh, small pets or other, other animals that are left unsupervised. Um, Low bushes or shrubs uh, near a high, near that provide hiding cover near a hunting area. Uh, some of the things that you know you may be attracting other animals that are that they have, the predators are going to eat, like for example bird feeders. Okay, bird seed. A lot of that bird seed will hit the ground, um, and if you're even you know throwing that bird seed on the ground, coyotes will eat bird seed, haviland will eat bird seed, a whole lot of critters will eat bird seed. Um, and then that besides birds, okay. Um, but the, the uh, key component to this is when these animals have access to habitat, you know, food, water, and cover, without any negative consequences or people, you know, disturbing them. So as you can see, green grass attracts rabbits. You know, pretty common, right? 
Okay. Everyone knows that? All right. All right. Um, kind of the way the Phoenix area has been developed, um, you know, we've put nice, beautiful golf courses in wash areas, uh, areas that were not suitable for development, uh, but that can, you know, you know, still be used, still be useful, okay? Uh, but these wash areas, uh, just in general, even before there was golf courses in there, are travel corridors for a lot of critters, okay? These animals use those as movement patterns and stuff, though, and, and for Indian Bend Wash, you know, uh, a coyote or any other animal can go a long ways without having to see people, you know, especially at night, okay, or, or running into any vehicles or any other, uh, any other uh, problems. Um, you know, good hiding cover during the summer, you know, drip sprinklers, you know, Havelina will be laying under there, cooling off, okay. And then the, again, the low-hanging fruit, coyotes will eat uh, uh, oranges uh, just as well as Havelina will as well. Again, we've created that urban oasis for ourselves, um, and same same thing that these animals are attracted to the, the water sources. You know, for example, you know how long have we been in a, in a drought here in the Phoenix area? Quite a long time, okay. Well, these coyotes in your neighborhood have never dealt with drought. Okay, there's always water. Okay, so there's water, there's food sources, and so yes, so these animals are more content. You'll see, certainly see higher concentrations of them because the, the, we've changed the harshness of our desert community. Um, and then, you know, when you had the human factor in there, I, you know, I fully expected Havelina to be actually eating out of this trough, you know, so. Kind of just some common urban wildlife here. Um, some things you're aware of and some things you're probably not, maybe not aware of. Um, but, you know, how many predators are on that list right there? Anyone guess? Oh, okay. well, well, I count eight, you know. Um, mostly the, some of those ones you don't think of, maybe the, the, the skunks, the raccoons, okay. But the hawks, owls, and falcons and stuff though. And, um, you know, when it comes to small pets, you know, people, most people don't consider that, you know, so we'll talk about a little bit about that in a minute, too. So today we're going to talk about urban coyotes. Um, and the reason why we talk about urban coyotes, probably not just because they're um, the most common animal in an urban area as far as urban predator. They're probably our number one problem animal because they, because they can eat anything, they can survive and thrive anywhere. Um, and then... Um, but a lot of these things that we've learned and how to deal with coyotes will also be very effective on other critters too. And we'll talk just a couple about a couple of specific animals that you may see here in Paris Valley in just a minute, okay? So, pretty common sight, you know, coyotes strolling down the road. Um, you know. <laughs> so. Oh, just a little caveat here and stuff though. I mean, I don't want to bore you to death, so I mean, we do have some kind of humor in here, so don't please don't take offense to it. We're not we're not trying to make light of any kind of uh, a potential serious situation, which we we know that it can be. Okay. So talking about basic coyote biology, you know, 15 to 30 pounds, all the stuffs on our website is in the brochures, things like that. Um, but some things to kind of point out would be their typical diet. Small mammals and birds make up about 80 percent of their diets. But if you read the rest of that, insects, reptiles, fruit, carrion, garbage, bird seed, pet food, small pets, really there's almost, there's almost nothing that a coyote won't eat, okay, as long as it's potentially edible, okay. They're not going to be like a billy goat and eat, you know, cans and things like that. But for the most part, um, they'll eat almost anything. But when coyotes are trapped and removed from an area, it can also, what it can do is it causes a social breakdown in their, in their social structure. Um, and it can cause a variety of crazy things to happen, okay? We may see where typically only a dominant male and female would breed. If you start messing with those, you might see, you know, several females uh, come into heat. Um, you would, where you would normally see, you know, um, six uh, average pups, you could have, you know, three female coyotes have a dozen pups, okay? So they, can, when they start dealing with loss, these animals will overcompensate their 
they're a survivalist, okay? There's really only one place in the U.S. where they've actually kept coyotes out of an area, and they've spent millions of dollars, okay? They're throwing everything at it, aerial gunning, poisons, you know, uh, snares, you know, you name it. But when they stop doing that, okay, they're going to have coyotes move in, okay? So what you can actually be doing by removing coyotes from an area, you can actually be in increasing the problem. Um, again, golf courses, you know, you, you provide habitat, open space, um, food sources. Um, typically only about 5-20% of coyotes survive their first year. There's a lot of challenges for a coyote pup, okay. Uh, coyotes can run at almost 40 miles per hour and jump over an 8 foot fence, okay. You know, um, I'm sure we've all seen that and stuff though. Um, how many people can run faster than 40 miles an hour? Show of hands. Okay. Let the record show. Nobody. Okay. So, and, and we'll talk a little bit about you know how to how to how to when you encounter a coyote and stuff though. But running from a coyote, you know, is not going to work. Okay. Uh, coyotes can breed with domestic dogs. It very rarely happens. Um, uh, but they're more naturally afraid of people than we are of them. Hopefully, that's the case. Well, if that's not the case, we can provide you with ways to that it becomes that way. Okay. Um, some other things, they're a highly adaptable, opportunity, opportunistic, predatory animal. They're highly intelligent, uh, easily trained or conditioned, uh, naturally fearful people again, but that fear is lost in stages, okay? It can be lost over in time by what we call proximity indifference. It's basically saying that the more often that those coyotes are around people without any negative consequences, the more comfortable they feel. And the more comfortable they feel, they will take more advantage of those situations. Food sources usually closer and closer to people in human-dominated areas. Uh, we can speed up that uh, prox uh, that that uh, uh, comfort level of them by humans feeding them, habituating them to human food sources. And there's 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 bad feeding, and then there's terrible feeding. Okay, bad feeding is if you're leaving food out and coyotes are coming to eat it. Okay, the terrible feeding is if you're actually rewarding that coyote for coming close to you. And we'll talk about some of those reasons, what, what, the, what the natural progression of that is. Um, they're not naturally aggressive towards larger opponents, um, but we do see kind of some problems, uh, especially with larger dogs this time of year when they are in breeding mode, uh, or especially if they have young. But usually the dominant male will be chasing dogs off, bigger dogs, because they're looking at a bigger dog as competition in two ways, possibly two ways. One, competition for food resources in the area. So if the uh, adult male coyote's got mouths to feed, okay, he doesn't want another, another comp want, doesn't want more competition for the, the available food sources. Secondarily, as you may see those coyotes see you know, a bigger dog as a predator on their young. I'll say that they may just be protecting their young, okay. Um, why do coyotes seem to be increasing in number? Um, typically, when they have abundance of prey species, abundance of other food sources, and uh, in a lot of cases, humans can unnaturally increase the, the number of coyotes in a given area. For example, some areas like, um, like downtown Phoenix, Steel Indian School Park, for example, there's a large, um, uh, several areas where there's uh, feral cat colonies. So people are coming in leaving trays of cat food out there. Coyotes have found that, found the cat food and as well as the cats as far as food source, okay? So that's entirely dependent upon what people have done, okay? Um, but acceptance of their presence, and, and again, encourages closer contact. So like I said, the more often that they're uh, around people without any negative consequences, they're starting to use your yard, you know, your, your neighbor's yard. You know, they, they're going to they're gonna keep encroaching. Kind of think of them as like, um, as kids. Sorry, sorry kids. Um, but they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna try to get away with what they can, okay? And when they get away with something, they're going to keep pushing a little bit further, okay? So um, again, what likely could be happening, okay, is you may be seeing the same number of coyotes just more often, okay, because they're not afraid of people, they're not running away, they're not hiding from people, okay. So this is specific to town of Paris Valley. How many people were at the uh, Coyote Awareness Program in 2008? It's been a while since I've been here, okay. So it was well overdue, okay, so, um, and um, so we came in and we talked to the folks uh, about coyotes specifically, kind of like what we're doing here, and it was you know same same issues as before, pets and, and people's concerns that there was you know too many coyotes. So kind of just put in perspective and stuff though. I mean you know if you were a coyote, where would you live? Up on top there or kind of in this green area? You know. 
you know, um, Paradise Valley is a beautiful place. Uh, the dark sky ordinance, it's very dark at night. You know, coyotes can go wander around at night out here and never be seen. Certainly in a large uh, oleander hedgerow like that, you know, heck, I could probably live in there, you know, so. <laughs> um, but, and this was, this was actually taken in Paradise Valley. Um, those quail look normal to you, and this isn't doctored at all, okay? Um, I was trying to make these the quail fly, and, and I was almost had to kick this thing, and it just fluttered up and just kind of landed back down. That is one fat quail, okay? Um, after I tried to mess with these birds for a little bit and stuff, though, I drove around the corner. Um, again, more oleanders and stuff, though, a real thick, good hiding cover, okay? See, a coyote could live under the, the oleanders and watch rabbits walk by and whoop, you know, wouldn't have to move, okay? Um, drove around the corner from seeing these big quail, there was two coyotes headed their direction, you know, and basically these were, you know, sitting ducks, you know. So again, you know, coyote or quail don't get that big unless they've been fed, okay? That, that's not, at least not a natural food, food source and stuff. So. so, and if you can see, that was back in 2008, that sign is different, this is on McDonald's. You know, I just thought I went, hey, that's different now. So, Get down to it. Um, coyotes are uh, in your area, and we're going to talk about some of the things that you know people have concerns about, and hopefully we can answer all of your questions, comment, and then we'll open it up for comments and questions at the end. Okay? Um, coyotes are a highly social animal. Packs are made up of non-breeding uh, offspring uh, from this year, and could be from last year as well. Okay? Uh, this social structure is mainly for the defense of food or territory. Uh, the pack formation and size of that pack um, is determined entirely by the available food sources. If you've got a lot of food out there, you're going to have a lot of coyotes. Okay? Um, more food means less, less competition uh, and less likelihood that um, the adult female and adult male are going to push the young out at the end of the year. It's probably in their best interest to keep other coyotes, mainly to keep other coyotes out you know, from raiding the kitchen. Um, some of the problems associated with urban coyotes, uh, some disease concerns, mange, December, other canine diseases. Um, you know, uh, people always have concerns about uh, rabies. Um, uh, your vaccinated pets are, are not at risk, um, even with mange and stuff though. It depends on the, the type of mange and stuff though. Um, uh, there is an oral vaccination or oral, oral treatment and stuff like this. How many people have seen that, that uh, episode on the, uh, the chupacabras on Discovery? That looks familiar, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah, pretty much just a mangy coyote. Okay. Um, some of the, and this is, these are the things I deal with, are, are cats and small dogs concerns, um, overwhelmingly, as far as the problems associated with coyotes in a neighborhood. Um, I don't know about you, but I think that, that cat's got other problems. <laughs> <laughs> that cat's probably looking for the nearest, nearest coyote to give himself up. <laughs> Kill me now, you know. Um, um, one thing, you know, when it comes to um, uh, keeping our pets safe, and, and, and I know this is kind of a joke, stuff, though, but I think the bottom line here is, is you know, keep your cats indoors. A um, lot of studies that are out there and stuff, though, um, that, you know, uh, show that cats live, you know, at least 50% longer lives uh, if they're indoor cats. Um, you know, uh, it comes down to what you think their quality of life is, I guess, and, and I get that. But there, there rarely goes a week when I don't drive to work and, and don't see a cat splatter on the side of the road. Okay, you know, and there are other things that can take advantage of cats that are out roaming the neighborhood. Okay, um, we can disguise our pets. Um, you know, a coyote won't a coyote won't eat a, a, a toad. Okay, so maybe, maybe that's the thing. You know, they know that the, the, those toads to secrete that toxin is going to make them all silly. So. Um, some other solutions. Um, I'm pretty sure this was reported to the Department of the Mountain Lion. So. Um, so when it comes to cats and, and small dogs uh, and their safety, there really is no su uh, substitution for supervision. Um, you know, you know, keep them indoors, keep a watchful eye on them if they are outdoors. If they have to be outside unsupervised, uh, we recommend something like a, a dog run or a pet run or something like that, okay? Because um, the more times that these animals are, are outdoors, uh, unsupervised, you know, you're kind of rolling the dice, okay? You know, we can, we'll talk a little bit about the coyote roller. There's ways to keep a coyote out of your yard. 
Um, I was talking to a woman um, that lived on uh, the Camelback Golf Club. Um, she, you know, the doorbell rang. Um, uh, it was her cleaning lady. She, the dogs were going nuts up though. She let the dogs out um, and went and answered the door. You know, went to go get the dogs. Came back, went outside, um, and there was a Harris hawk that had killed one of her dogs. And and she knew that they roosted there, stuff though. But you know, and, and people you know think that well, you know, my dog's too big for an owl or hawk to fly away from with it. Well, that's probably the case. But they don't have to fly away with it, and stuff though. They can kill it and consume it right there, and stuff though. So, um, you know, coyote roller works very well keeping coyotes out. They're not going to work on a hawk or an owl. Uh, walking your dog. Uh, keep dog on a leash. Um, how many people saw that that gentleman's dog was tore up by the javelina last week? Um, you know, when he says, oh, my dog came running back all bloody and stuff, though, I'm like, running back, you know, he tells me the dog was off the leash, okay. Um, but, you know, keep your dogs on a leash. You know, there's a leash law in Arizona. Um, be aware of your surroundings, you know. Um, I, don't, I know it's not easy to do, but if you can avoid walking along big oleander hedgerows like that, you know, do it. Or, flashlight or something like that you know make some noise um, if you can walk in groups buddy system okay carry a walking stick use it make yourself appear larger okay um, but if you do encounter a coyote uh, again unless you can run 40 miles an hour don't run okay um, one interesting thing you know if you do run from a coyote or you're you're walking your dog and you're running you're, you and your dog are running from a from a coyote that can invoke that predator prey chase response um, how many people how many people have pets here Okay, um, you know, dogs, you know, even now that have been bred for thousands of years, you run a string in front of them, oh, gotta get it, you know, or the laser pointer, you know, they gotta get it. That's, that's instinct, okay? And we, now we're talking about a truly wild animal, okay? I mean, they, they've got that instinct, okay? So that can invoke that chase response, okay? So what you wanna do is you wanna stand your ground, okay? You want if you have small dogs, you wanna pick them up. If you've got big dogs, you wanna, you know, pull that leash close, keep them tight. Make that coyote focus on you, okay? That most instances, and we'll talk about reasons why coyotes attack people, but they're not, right, if they're coming after that little dog and stuff though, they don't care about you, okay? And there's reasons for that too that will we'll change that behavior. But you want to be aggressive toward these animals, okay? You want to be talking low, loud tones. Oh, ah, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, try to make yourself appear big, okay? You don't want to scream, high-pitched screams and stuff though. That can also evoke that predator response and stuff though. Uh, hunters actually go out and call coyotes in by using wounded animal sounds, okay? So low, loud tones, okay, and make eye contact and be aggressive towards them. If you can grab something, a handful of rocks, pepper them with it, use what you can. But if you don't make that animal run away, he just learned that you're not a threat, okay? And you're not helping yourself or your neighbors, okay? Um, now we'll talk about some chemical deterrents, pepper sprays and things like that too. You know, if a coyote's gonna breach that, you know, uh, zone where you can feel comfortable spraying them, you know, let them have it, you know, if you got pepper spray. Pepper spray is very effective at close range. Um, can, you know, affect you as well, okay? But doing some of these other things that we'll talk about, you probably never need, if we're doing those things, okay, and we're changing coyote behavior, we'll never need to use pepper spray at that close range, okay? Um, Talking about uh, children and, and adult safety, again, um, uh, you know, I say children should be supervised, um, and you would think, you know, that a, uh, just off the top of my head, you'd think that a, a toddler down on the ground looking like, you know, a small animal on hands and knees would actually be, you know, a, an attractant, so to speak, okay? Well, well, hopefully I'm not the one that has to tell people with toddlers to watch their kids, but to put it in perspective, um, you know, again, that, and then, Coyotes, you know, really just don't go after adults, okay, or, you know, standing upright. We don't look like a food source. But since 1997, we've had 18 coyote incidents where coyotes have either bit, scratched, you know, basically attacked a human. It's actually more adults in there than, than kids. Um, uh, worst case scenario for a, for a coyote bite, uh, someone had to have four or five stitches, okay. Um, and then kind of to put it in perspective, every year Maricopa County Animal Care and Control reports well over 5,000 dog bites on, on people, okay? And those are just the ones that are reported. Those are not the ones where people get bit by their own dog. And, and basically, it, it would be serious enough for someone to seek medical treatment, okay? Or report it directly to them, okay? If it's a neighbor's dog or something like that, okay? Um, and how many people have seen the, the, the verdict today on Mickey? 
you know, Mickey gets to live with some, you know, some, you know, he has to walk a tight line, you know, but again, you know, that, those are serious injuries, you know, from domestic dogs, animals that have been bred around people for thousands of years, okay? So, you know, you're probably a thousand times more likely to get bit by your own dog or neighbor's dog, and, and, and again, we've never had anyone killed by a coyote in Arizona. Uh, whereas, you know, at least maybe once, once a year, once every couple of years, someone has been, you know, someone's been, someone's actually died from a, a domestic dog bite, okay? So kind of keep that in mind and stuff though when you're dealing with, with, with coyotes, okay? Hopefully that eases some, some tension a little bit, okay? Um, and it never even has to get to that point either, okay? Um, let me back up real quick. Um, of those 18 coyote incidents, okay, uh, we know for a fact 15 of those people were actually feeding coyotes, okay? A couple of years in 2012, um, how many people remember the, uh, the three people that were bit within 48 hours of the trilogy at Bastancia? These coyotes, okay, one woman was, was napping, another guy was reading his book, um, another guy was uh, reading the newspaper, okay? Same, basically same time of day, um, coyote came up and nipped at them and ran, okay? That tells me that whoever was feeding them, that was their, it was, it was all on the patio. So it tells me that whoever was feeding them probably wasn't around, maybe went on vacation or something like that. But coyote, that was normal coyote behavior, or normal behavior for that coyote to come up and look for the handout, and he was getting rewarded for it. Okay. So we came in and we killed six coyotes. Okay. Got the probably most likely the defending animal on the last day. So now what? Okay, we back up. This is actually a gentleman that actually broke up his, his own dog's fight, deep puncture wounds. Um, you know, lots of antibiotics, very painful. Um, you can see, see the logo there. I, I wanted to hide his face there, so I, I promised him I would. So, so see, and, and, and all the like, you know, so that would even get reported, you know, um, as a dog bite, even if it was all stuff there, because he sent, had to go through uh, medical care. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can remove coyotes. Um, coyotes are hunted year-round um, outside of the area, valley here, um, and there's really been absolutely zero impact on the population. Okay. Um, kind of put in perspective, people usually don't go too far to hunt. This is probably somewhere in the Midwest and stuff. He's probably not impacting the coyote population. So if you want to start removing coyotes, keep in mind it's going to be a long-term uh, thing, and I don't know if you'll ever remove all the coyotes from the valley here. Um, you know, most people say, well, why can't we just uh, trap them and take them to Flagstaff? And, you know, I don't know why Flagstaff gets the bad rap and why they, why they need coyotes. Um, but, you know, I like Flagstaff, you know. But, um, um, and people say, you know, um, why doesn't the agency do that? Okay. Well, one is you start taking animals, um, you know, that could be diseased, okay. Uh, canine distemper, for example. Canine distemper can wipe out Havilland populations. Um, uh, new home versus home sweet home. How many people would like for me to take their credit cards, their ID, you know, uh, and drop them in a country where they don't know the language? You know, it's going to be stressful, correct? Okay. So you know, just from being in a trap, put put, put in a in a new location, um, you know, animals their resist their um, their uh, resistance can be worn down and stuff. Though they can die slowly, they get pushed around. Uh, there's really no un you know unoccupied territory, so to speak. At least no place that would be good, you know, if, it, if it's good habitat, guarantee there's coyotes there, okay? Again, so we're dealing with stress-related deaths, and then even removing those coyotes, we've seen, um, for example, we've seen coyotes come back, um, and we've seen actually the problems um, uh, get actually, you know, just as bad as before. Um, way back when, in 2008, when I was here, um, Actually, Chief Winterstein actually spoke on this comment and stuff, though, that he had uh, a trapper come in at a, in a community here in Paradise Valley, and they removed 22 coyotes from a, from a community in more like a six-month time frame. Uh, within six weeks, they were seeing coyotes again, and within six months, the problem was just as bad as it was before. Okay, so you had a real, you know, they just flew back in. So what we're going to talk about some of the things that we can do. If you want to do trap and removal, that's an option, okay? Um, it's not a very good long-term option, unless you do a lot of other things. You have, if you want to remove coyotes, stuff though, and you're doing all these other things, you'll have a longer time frame before you see the problems again, okay? But coyotes will be there, okay? Um, you know, there's people that, you know, actually feed coyotes. Um, 
and like I said, of those, you know, it, that that's and and that's why it's illegal, you know, because of that's where the, the aggressive behavior happens. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about how we fix the problem um, and some of the short, again short-term solutions. Um, remo removal of these animals by licensed professional uh, Chris Fitzgerald with Critter Getter is here. Um, he may want to speak. You want to speak a little bit later. We can we may answer some questions or something. Um, uh, we, as, as an agency, Arizona Game and Fish Department um, uh, gives them a license to be able to do this. They could live trap uh, on private property. We recommend that they euthanize all the adult coyotes, uh, mainly because no, really no place to put them. Um, we, we were actually doing some uh, research in the late 90s um, in Indian Ben Wash. Uh, they were taking coyotes, trapping you know, tagging them putting uh, you know, VHF S collars on them, VHF collars. Uh, they were taking them on the backside of uh, uh, Four Peaks Mountain down towards, uh, um, down towards Roosevelt Lake. Seven years later, a coyote was hit and killed on the road in Chandler. It still had the, 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 the collar on it. So that animal went a long ways. Okay? So again, as far as largely ineffective, as far as you know, trapping and removal, and those kinds of things. Um, we did provide a list of license holders Okay, so that is an option for you. Uh, some other short-term uh, solutions and stuff, though, when we are dealing with aggressive animals, we're talking about animals that are burying their teeth, growling, coming towards people. Okay, um, and certain in the in, in the absence of a food source. Okay, if you're out there walking your dog, you get a coyote growling at you, it has nothing to do with you. Don't don't take it personally. Okay, if they want that dog or they want your cat or something like that. Okay. But if you're out there by yourself and you got coyotes following you, growling, coming close to you, we want to know about it. We want to know about it as soon as possible. In those cases, we're going to come in and we're going to kill coyotes until we feel the situation is relieved. Okay. So whether whether we do it or Chris does it, okay, it, it, it's a band-aid. Okay. Without changing those underlying issues as to reasons why those coyotes got aggressive in the first place. Okay. The other coyotes that move in. Okay. And think about where you're at in Paradise Valley. You got coyotes all around you. Okay. You're not getting coyotes fresh from the desert that are scared of people. You're getting coyotes from, from you know, over here at cattle tracks and you know, along the canals, you know, golf courses and things like this. Coyotes that are just as used to being around people as the ones you got rid of. Okay. So, here's a, a map of the Phoenix metropolitan area uh, from 2012. Uh, there was, I believe, 300 and some no, 600 some kind of calls or whatever. Um, really not many places where we're not getting coyote calls, right? You know, and, and some of these areas, you know, where you do see holes, you know, out here, you know, kind of out in this, this farming country, they're not going to call us to report a coyote, they're handling the situation. They're probably shooting it, you know, which is, which is legal in, in, some, in a lot of instances, okay. But again, you know, there's really no place where there's not coyotes. Um, Really, you know, we haven't seen them in downtown Phoenix. Okay. Some of those are some of those are kind of anomalies down there, like these two here. Someone probably decided to live in Phoenix and then short down Phoenix, so it's going to put a dot in the center. But these two right here, yeah, those are definitely Kyle calls right around Third Avenue, Third Street, south of Thomas. So um, we're going to talk about some long-term solutions, things that we can do together, uh, things we can do to help each other out. You know, first and foremost, don't feed coyotes. Um, if people are feeding about feeding coyotes, we want to know about it. Okay, um, some of the things we can do around our own home: removing uh, or altering uh, the attractants, clearing the low bushes. You know, with your oleanders, you know, trim up some of that low vegetation where a coyote can't hide under there. You can see under there. If you can see under the in, under your bushes, coyote can't hide in there. Okay, uh, but also removes the hiding cover for the, the rabbits and things like that that the coyotes are looking to eat. Okay. Pick up your fallen fruits, you know, uh, change your bird feeding. You know, I'm not, not against bird feeding, but just do it, you know, in a, in a manner that we're to lessen the amount of birds he hits the ground, okay? Um, clean your barbecue grills, your garbage. But the other thing is, is, is actively discouraging coyotes. Um, you know, community-wide effort. You know, we used to recommend, you know, years ago, how many people have seen the, the shaker can? Okay. You know, this used to be a, a great tool. And, and it still works pretty well on javelina. If you throw this in the middle of the javelina herd, you can see them all kind of disperse and they'll go crazy and stuff, though. Um, this may get a coyote's attention, but it's... How many, how many people are scared by that? 
you know, and that really, you know, um, you know, when it was new, it probably worked very well. Now kayaks go, see that trick, okay, <laughs> you know, you know, throw it at them, you know, if that's all you got, you know, okay. But there's some better things out there, again, pepper spray, you know, if you, if you all you got is you know, a handful of rocks, pepper, be rude to these animals, okay. We need to let them know that we're the top dog in the block, not them. Some of the things that we've found that are not only effective, certainly cost effective well as well. You know, pepper spray and bear spray can be kind of expensive, okay? This this jug has seen some miles here. I bought it probably about four years ago for 79 cents at Walmart, okay? This is household ammonia, okay? Don't get the lemon scent, okay? It doesn't work very well like we found out. Um, about a 20% solution of household ammonia. This, on the back of it, says it's an irritant. Okay, it was in your eyes, wash your eyes, all the stuff like this, at this concentration. And this isn't nowhere near anhydrous ammonia, okay? This is only about 5-10% ammonia was mixed with water and some other things, okay? Um, we're recommending 20% household ammonia, rest the water, and get yourself one of these high-powered squirt guns. There's super soakers, you know, common brand name, okay? Um, the beauty of this model is that you can have your ammonia free pre-mixed, load it up with a cap on it, and this model here will accept up to a two liter bottle, of, and they're all the same cap size here, okay. Um, this one will shoot up to 20 feet. There's models of super soaker out there that will shoot 30, 40 feet or better, okay. How many people are seeing coyotes within that range right now? Quite a bit, I'm sure, okay. All right. Um, you hit a coyote with a diluted ammonia, okay. On your property, you will probably never see that coyote on your property again. Okay, this is an irritant. And if it's on them, Curtis, you want to pass that around? Let everyone get a good sniff of that. I'm just kidding. Um, um, it's smelling salt. It, it, it's nasty stuff. Okay, think about an animal that's probably got 30 times our nasal capacity. Okay, think how bad that would burn our nasal senses. Okay, this is on them. Okay, and they can't get away from that. They're going to remember that negative experience. You're trying to do two things by spraying a coyote with, with ammonia, okay? One, you're trying to uh, get that condition, that coyote, to associate the location with a negative experience, thereby learning to avoid that location, okay? Secondarily, though, and this is the best thing, though, is if they know that a human is causing this irritation, you're helping yourself, your neighbors, and your, and your neighborhood, your community, okay? And this is, you know, where we'll see the best effect and stuff, though, is the more people doing these kinds of things, okay? You know, removing the food sources, stuff that we have control over, you know. I'm not, I'm not telling you to go, you know, knock down the golf course or, you know, take out your grass and all that stuff, though. Um, but the things we have control over, you know, we can certainly, you know, make a change in behavior of these coyotes. Right now we're seeing coyotes that are not afraid of people because that's the norm, okay. There's no reason for these coyotes to be afraid of people right now, okay. So there's other things, though, to keep a coyote out of your yard. Again, people have all probably seen the coyote roller. Uh, found at coyoteroller.com. It's a commercial product. Um, I did talk to one guy that he said, he goes, oh yeah, I see that. That looks good. So I'll have my guys work on it today. So I mean, he's got guys that can make his own. So I mean, you know, that, that's another option for you. Some of the other types of fence modifications I've seen is some of that wrought iron stuff, decorative stuff. You know, as long as there's not a place for them to get a foothold on top. Okay. Um, coyote. What happens? Okay, we'll do a little demonstration. The coyotes, you know, that a six foot fence or higher is what they recommend on the website. Coyotes need two bounds to get up and over. So what they do is they jump up, use their moment, get a hold of the top of the fence or wall, use their momentum to, with their, after they get their front paws up there to pull themselves up and over. What happens is they can't get a foothold on the top of the fence or wall and basically take a header right into that fence. Okay, so so you have to have it on a perimeter. Okay, you know. Um, there, there's other things and stuff, though. There's a bunch of stuff out there. You know, what we're, we're talking about is, you know, a, a 79 cent bottle of ammonia and a $10 super soaker. You know, you can spend $28 for a four foot length of fence. Um, real quick, sir? The, the ammonia spray you're talking about, would that help to spray the top of your fence? Not really. Uh, ammonia is a highly volatile substance, you know, like, kind of like uh, rubbing alcohol. It will quickly dissipate, especially as it gets hotter and. and this time you're more more of it's about the, the humidity level. It's real dry. Um, there's talk of you know people taking you know adult male urine and peeing around their yard. And uh, one, I don't know if anyone wants to take a squirt bottle or who's the guy that wants to pee in a bottle for them. 
you know, there's there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's out there, you know. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure how effective it is, but kind of with a lot of these things, the more things you do, the better off you're going to be. Uh, ammonia can work very well, like in small areas, for, for like javelina, for example. Um, let's see. Like ammonia soaked rags, if they're kind of bedding down in an area or they're around some sensitive plants, things like that. Um, this next slide. Um, how many here are here in Paris Valley, Mummy Mountain, um, Camelback Mountain, and stuff though? Um, and kind of along those same lines, they're getting very comfortable around people too. Um, this uh, ammonia and stuff though, we had to go rescue a, a, one of the little reds out of a, a concrete uh, enclosure. You know, it was only you know, 10 inches or something. I guess the little one couldn't get out. Mom, when we got up there, mom was huffing and puffing and at us, clacking her teeth. We sprayed the ammonia. We even missed her. Okay, mom caught wind of that ammonia, took off running. Okay, we were able to kind of work on getting the little one out though, and it's kind of like a grease pig. These little things are really a lot faster than you think. Um, three other big javelina, adult javelina, you know, kind of heard the commotion, came came up to that same area. They stopped, and turned and ran the other direction. So, so, so we know this stuff works works well. It works very well. So, so until someone can tell me, no, Darren, you're full of shit. Um, it doesn't work, okay. Um, then we've got to rethink everything and then we'll have to come back to the drawing board and we'll maybe come up with something new or whatever, maybe some pepper balls, pepper paint balls, or who knows what and stuff though. But again, this is not only effective, but cost effective, okay. You know, you can, you can spend thousands of dollars on modifying your fencing. You know, there's a lot of other crazy products out there, you know. Uh, you can spend, as, you know, a little bit, little bit of money and spend time and effort by dealing with these animals by with the, with the super soaker, or you can throw a lot of money at it, you know, or you know, close your pets, close, you know, you know section off a portion of your yard. There's all kinds of strategies to you know keep your pet safe and things like this. But by keeping coyotes out of your yard, you're not really changing the coyotes' behavior. That's why I recommend being aggressive towards them. So, um, Havelina, uh, pretty easy to deal with, and certainly, uh, like I said, the shaker can works very well. Most instances where, where people are say they were charged by javelina, um, it's an instance where they come around a corner, it's, it's at night, and what, what do people do when they see a pack of javelina? <gasps> you know, they freeze. These animals don't see that well, um, but they see movement very well. Okay, If you've got a little bit of breeze blowing in your face, you basically, and you stop moving, you become invisible to them. Okay, One javelina may have saw the movement and sounded the alarm and took off the other direction, and the rest of them just freaking out and running willy-nilly. Some of them running right into the face of you know what you would be the, your, your your danger. Okay, clap your hands, stomp your feet, yell at them. So though, we have seen some of these animals become aggressive um, in the past, um, but it's most it's almost always centered around medium to large sized dogs. They're looking at those dogs as they would a coyote. They're gonna and they will go on the offensive to chase a coyote away from their young and away from the, the herd. Okay. Um, but again, the ammonia works very well. Think, you know, these animals can smell grubs down in the soil, you know, 10 to 12 inches, and dig for them. You know, so yeah, that ammonia is going to be very effective on them as well. Okay, so um, you know, again, most issues. Um, the last javelina bite we had was uh, in Tempe. Uh, people at uh, a, a all night 24 hour lab were, you know, their big thing at night when they're out for smoke breaks is to feed the javelina. Okay. Some, someone during the day should have didn't know that was what was going on and got bit on the butt. So. Um, again, this is a this is actually in Fountain Hills. People were on their in their uh, balcony, you know, over in a condo complex, throwing throwing food down to them. You know, again, you can see the character. They're cute little guys when they're that small and stuff, though. But kind of just a weird, goofy animal, but pretty easy to deal with, you know, by using the ammonia. Um, they they don't. They're not predators. They're they're looking for plant material. That's where the problem is, is with property damage with them eating your plants and things like this. And there are strategies, planting different types of plants that are heavily resistant. Certainly ways to protect your plants as well. So, so um, bobcats are starting to become the new coyote. Um, they're they've started to figure it out uh, a couple of years ago. Where people are is where the food sources are. Um, mainly they're looking for for birds, uh, rabbits, things like this. Uh, and mainly the bigger birds, you know, the quail, the, the doves, uh, pigeons, and things like this. 
and they're very good. I mean, being a cat, they're good at catching things and stuff. Though um, you don't need to go to the extreme of um, you know the super soaker or we I mean, use super soaker, but you don't need the ammonia with 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 uh, bob cats. Just turn the hose on. Uh, like a domestic cat, they don't like being soaking wet. Okay, they'll see that as an irritant. It may take you a couple times, you know, or you know, if you want to go right off the bat, use ammonia. That'll work too. Okay. Um, this is actually in the East Valley. Um, and this is what actually happened when they got rid of their coyotes. And they had very few coyotes. There was a, there was a, um, a, a troop of uh, Harris hawks that um, just weren't doing the job. So that's a lot of rabbits. Okay. So they hired a company to come in. Um, actually, uh, cottontail rabbits are, are a, uh, considered small game. You know, they are an edible species. Um, so we, uh, the, the golf course actually needed to get a permit. Uh, and then they just put that person on the the company down there as an agent, he came in using non-toxic shot and killed them and took them to like Liberty Wildlife or Adobe Mountain, places that could be, they could be used as food sources for predators and, and uh, birds of prey and stuff. So, but see, you know, again, that's what happens, you know, kind of when you mess with that balance of predator-prey relationships. Okay, um, and these are some of the problems that I deal with, and this is where Arizona Game and Fish Department sits right here on the fence. Okay. Um, we got people that are feeding animals, and then there's people that are concerned that they're you know, destroying his way of life, his his property, and things like that. Um, you know, be a good neighbor. You know, try not to do things that you're you know going to attract animals. Um, and in reality, it's actually illegal to feed wildlife. Okay. Um, in the state of Arizona, a person commits unlawful feeding of wildlife by intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly feeding, attracting, or otherwise enticing wildlife into an area. Even if you say you're putting bread on the ground for, for birds, and if coyotes and javelin are coming to eat it, you're feeding wildlife. Okay? This affects counties that have a population of 280,000 or more. So right now, Maricopa County, Pima County, and Pinal County are affected by this law. Okay? Um, and I do believe Paradise Valley has a town ordinance. Um, and uh, against feeding of coyotes specifically. Okay. And actually, years ago, Chief Winterstein actually went down and, and uh, spoke to the legislature, and this is, you know, he helped us get this law uh, uh, drafted on a state level. So, what do we do? How do we work this out? Okay. Um, most of these issues um, are fairly easy to deal with. Okay. If I, as being a wildlife biologist, I wish I could you know, manage wildlife. Well, that's not the case. Most of my job deals with managing people and talking to people's issues with wildlife. These animals are simply reacting to their environment. Okay? Um, as humans, we've modified the environment. Uh, we've created opportunities uh, for wildlife. Uh, as humans, we dominate the environment. We have control over the environment to, to a lot of extent. Okay? Uh, and human behavior is the only thing we can directly change. Okay? But if we change human behavior, we can affect a change in wildlife. Okay? So that's where it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a human thing and it's a numbers game. The more people doing these things, the better off everyone's going to be. You'll see quicker results, longer lasting results when we have more people. So basically, um, this resolution of conflict where it works the best is when you, you're dealing with it as a neighborhood, as a, as a, as a, as a community, the more people involved, like I said, okay? Talking about living with wildlife, okay, uh, uh, requires, a, it's a dynamic process. It's, these things are, these things ebb and flow, you know, rabbit populations go up and down, coyote populations go up and down, at least the, the, the ones in your visible, visible area, okay? Uh, we're talking about, you know, that's why your folks are here, hopefully, talk a little bit of knowledge um, and some awareness on things that you can do. Um, so taking some responsibility if you are, you know, creating opportunities for wildlife, leaving your uh, uh, pet food out or bird seed, things like that. Um, we want responsible citizens and, and communities uh, to help with this resolution because you know, if, if we don't do anything, the problem will get worse. Okay? Um, cooperation, support, getting everyone on the same page. And one of the things that we're, you know, we're not saying, you know, we say, hey, there's coyotes out there, live with it. Okay, that's not what we're doing. We're not, you know, that's not what we're doing as an agency. That's not what the town of Paradise Valley is doing. We're not saying, hey, live with it. Okay, we want to teach you how to live with it because these things have been effective. We know they've been effective, and we want to, you know, give you the skills to affect some change. You know, whether it's, you know, your own coyotes, your own property, and things like that. You know, that's why we, why we do these public meetings. Like I said, it's a lot easier for me to talk to a group of folks than to, you know, spend. 
you know, the same amount of time. This is basically what I do with each caller, is talk, you know, a long, drawn out things on there, things everyone can do. So if I get 10 calls in a day, <laughs> that pretty much takes up my day, okay? Um, so, and usually I get a lot more than that. But this is what we want to have happen, okay? We want people to be able to enjoy their backyard, okay? We want to live with wildlife, but on our terms, okay? So people can enjoy the backyard, dogs happy, you know, people can view wildlife, which is plenty fine. We love people watching wildlife, okay? That's a different, you know, component of this whole thing, okay? Um, and then, you know, everyone's keeping their distance, okay? Just some kind of real quick things, and these questions always come up, okay? Uh, Arizona Game and Fish Department is, is a, is a non-general fund agency. We get zero money, okay? Most of our uh, funding comes from sales of hunting and fishing licenses with big game tags and things like that. Uh, I am heritage funded, so if you're pay playing the, the, the state lottery, you know, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, we do get some, uh, some uh, uh, with a pack for the a uh, little bit of Indian gaming money as well. So, so but, but by and large, you know, we're what we're doing as an agency is, is, is not is not taxpayer. Not, it's actually zero taxpayer money. Okay, unless you do a little check off for non game on your income taxes. Um, our region, and I'll show you kind of show you a map of how big our region is. Um, we have the highest density pop density of population in the state. Uh, about 70% of the population lives in the Phoenix metropolitan area, which we encompass that entire area and more. So practically 4 million people in the county. Uh, we just we have about 40 employees that work out of our field office. And there's really only, uh, for Paradise Valley and all of Scottsdale, there's Officer Curtis Herbert here. Okay. Uh, and I back him up, I'll, I'll take calls and things like this. Uh, but when there's a problem, Officer Herbert will be the one responding. Um, and that's why we rely, rely on uh, police departments. If there is truly an emergency, call 911. Uh, they're very good at triaging the call, knowing the call, knowing what can happen. They know how to get a hold of us if there is an emergency, you know, an attack or anything like that. And then they, they know how to get a hold of our dispatch, and our dispatch will get a hold of Curtis. If Curtis is not available, the next guy and stuff will move down, down the chain. So it is. Um, but that's not Curtis's only uh, responsibility. He's got you know law enforcement duties on uh, your uh, urban lakes. Um, does a lot of IND presentations for you know children's schools, um, watercraft patrols on you're on Saguaro, correct? Saguaro Lake. He's the primary law enforcement uh, officer on Saguaro Lake, um, and he's got to do all this within a 40-hour work week. Um, how many officers does Paris Valley have uh, total? 29. 29. Okay. And that's, you know, a, an area that, you know, I'll we'll show you kind of just... So that's why we triage calls and we respond when public safety is an issue, okay? This is our region. This is Camp Verde up here. Uh, Casa Grande and Coolidge down here, or Eloy. Uh, White Tank Mountains on the, on the west side. Uh, Globe, Miami, all the way up under the, the Mogollon Rim. That's 40 employees that, you know, we're talking about fisheries, habitat, all kinds of different things, okay? our front counter staff. So here's Officer Herbert's uh, district, again, City of Scottsdale, all the way up to Cape Creek, uh, out to Bartlett Lake, uh, and out in these areas with the exception of the reservations and stuff. Uh, here's Paradise Valley. So you get one guy, 29. So that's why we, like I said, we rely on, on, on our police forces, our sheriff's deputies and things like this to, to assist us when there, when there truly is an emergency. Okay, some final messages. Um, fed coyote is a dead coyote. Um, usually because a fed coyote becomes aggressive towards people. Okay? Um, if you hate coyotes, be rude to them. That's, that's pretty easy to, you know, to get across, right? Um, if you love coyotes, you need to be rude to them as well. Okay? Um, that's a little harder message to, to pass along. But, you know, there's, there's reasons why they make binoculars. There's reasons why there's telephoto lens. You don't need to take a picture of a coyote, you know, at two feet away, okay. Um, you know, be an active participant. Participant, excuse me. Uh, help spread the word to your neighbors that weren't able to make it here tonight. And kind of keep in mind that. And, and I should probably change that with the rabbit picture and stuff, though, because you know things can always be worse. Okay. So now we'll do. We'll have some time for questions and stuff, though. So, prayer. Right uh, thank you. My name is Brad Forst, and I'm meeting a lot of you folks who I've corresponded with over the last six months. Um, sir, this 
event tonight started with 110 people living on the Marriott Golf Course saying we have a problem. And that's what led Paradise Valley to get involved. That's what led to this meeting. I think we're missing the point. And um, it is my guess that most of the people here are here to talk to their elected representatives and to Officer Albert and tell them about the problem we're having. And with all due respect, the educators, education is good, but we don't need an education, we need a solution. There's been a terrible problem created, and someone needs to be responsible for fixing that problem. So I think you'll hear a lot of people talk about brush and habitat and bunnies and rabbits, all those things that are encouraging and creating coyote populations, somebody is responsible for that, not the people who are in this room. And somebody needs to take responsibility for that, not the people who are in this room. That's my bet about, I think, why a lot of people are here. Anyone like to comment on that? I, mean, I don't have any control over the property or anything like this. I'm just, I have control over managing coyotes and stuff else. So, do anyone else want to, anyone want to address that scenario or we'll yeah. let it go for a little bit? Um, yeah, you know, I would, uh, Vice Mayor Collins here, and thank you, and um, thank you, Darren, and uh, thank you, Curtis, for being here. And um, um, I will address, uh, Brad, uh, what we've been working with, but uh, maybe right now some of you may have questions still for Darren and Curtis, and I think we have, um, and not to, not to postpone our conversation, but I know we also have someone here from, uh, from Curtis Control, so if there are any any questions specific to them, uh, maybe we can give them the courtesy of, of asking those questions now, and then and then I will come back and, and answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, right. When do they All day long, or? Well, right, and, 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 and I apologize for not putting that on there. That comes up every time, and I keep forgetting to put it on there. Um, coyotes are not a nocturnal animal. Um, they're most active at dawn and dusk, okay? Um, and that's, you know, given the, the stimulus of people, you know, without people being around, okay? Um, and a lot of it can be seasonal as well, okay? In the winter time when it's nice out, kind of think of it, you know, in these terms, okay? If it's nice for you folks or for us to be outside recreating and, and being in the yard, enjoying things like this, it's nice enough for a coyote to be out there as well, okay? And kind of look, you know, you'll see rabbits kind of change their behavior too seasonally. In the, in the summer months, they're gonna be active at night. Same thing with coyotes, okay? So, but a lot of that, again, depends on how comfortable they are around people. What we've seen on the fringe areas um, is coyotes being more active at night, even in the winter time, because they've changed their behavior to be active when people are not, okay? When they get comfortable in, a, in around people, you will see them at all times of the day. You know, typically, you know, you may see a coyote out during the middle of the day during the summer. Um, it's probably not hunting it, probably, you know, the, the, the shade move and things like that, and he's looking for another, another place to lay down, in, okay? So, you know, it's a lot harder for a coyote to cool down, okay? So that's when they are more active at night. Okay? Right. right, yeah, and you know, and it's a little warm and stuff like this, but again, it's, it's all about their comfort level. I know there was a question in the back here first. Do whistles work for coyotes? Um, you might get their attention. Um, with anything, you know, if you're all bark and no bite, you know, something that's not going to either give them a little bit of a sting or an irritation like that ammonia may not be as effective. You know, um, right off the bat, you know, if it's the first time a coyote's been around people or coyote's still kind of keeping their distance, that may, you know, get their attention, but I don't know how effective it would be. You know, you think maybe like a dog whistle as an irritant, possibly? Yeah, like a police whistle. Um, I'm not sure about a police whistle, necessarily. You know, you may get your neighbors coming to your aid thinking, you know, are you okay, are you okay? So, yeah, I, I don't know how effective it would be. Uh, I have a question. I, I've seen three on 14 acres in the wash that we just you guys out years ago because we had a huge problem with coyotes back then. Mm -hmm. Do you find that, because I've, I've noticed this year there have been more coyotes than the previous year, mm -hmm. um, are there more coyotes everywhere because of what's happened with the rain and other stuff valley-wide, or is it just in Paradise Valley? I don't think... Did you get the question? 
Oh, the, the question was is, is if there's uh, it's a, if it's a valley wide phenomenon that we're seeing more coyotes based on drought and weather and things like this. Um, I don't see that at, at typically as an issue. We've seen you know more there may be more of an uptick when, in times of drought kind of on the fringe areas, um, but we just haven't seen the drought effects here in the valley. You know these you know the, the grass is still green, the, 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 the your pools are still full, your fountains and all this stuff they're still available and stuff though. So you know the green grass attracts the small critters and things like this. You know a lot of it you know it, it may be you know a temporary uptake in population. You know these these uh, predator populations respond kind of offset to to prey populations. If you see, you know, a large rabbit population, you can bet that after the next breeding cycle, you're going to see a large number of predators. Okay, so a lot of it kind of they kind of ebb and flow, and you're going to go back and forth asynchronously. Okay, so um, and then with what happened with the wash, you know, in that golf course, we did see some animals or some some problems and stuff though because it was dirt. There was no rabbits out there. Okay, those rabbits had to move. Those rabbits went into your neighborhood, your community. You know, and then coyotes just followed them. And when they're they're following them, you know, if if a rabbit's probably a lot harder to catch than you know a you know 12, 15 year old dog, you know. So, and then they they just they're gonna go off the easiest meal they can find. Okay, in the back. Yeah, can you talk about how effective a eight foot tall fence would be with no horizontal member on top? Uh, not very effective. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on what's on the other side too. You know, uh, why does a coyote need to cross the road, kind of thing? You know, not not you know, I'm not, not trying to make you know make that make a joke or anything. But you know, coyotes going to go to the the uh, effort to get over an eight foot fence if there's a food source on the other side. But I thought you said if there was nothing to for them to grab onto, it'd be difficult to scale that. Right, and what are you talking about? It's on top of your fence. Nothing, just just straight up spikes. Oh yeah, that would that would be very effective at keeping a coyote out of your yard. Okay, right, right here. If they're opportunistic, do they tend to come back to a place where they've attacked previously? Certainly, um, if if they know there's a food source there. Okay. So if your animal has been attacked in your yard. The chances of them coming back is high. At least right away, okay. Um, um, I chased a coyote around my neighborhood, um, and I was trying to you know, run this thing over. Uh, I'll admit it. Um, um, and I backed up and stuff. this thing. I'm like, why isn't this thing leaving? He ran over and he picked up the cat, and ran off with it. Okay. Um, but what what happens? And and, and I don't want to be crude or you know graphic or anything like this. Coyote kills an animal. Doesn't, coyote's not killing just randomly for no reason. Coyote's killing to eat. Okay, so you go out there. Coyote's got to hold your dog. You chase that coyote away and stuff. Though that coyote's gonna is afraid of you at that point. It's gonna run away, but it's not going far. It's waiting and it's keeping an eye out for when you when the you're the threat. When the threat goes away, it's gonna come back and try to you know find his meal. Okay, so a lot of those things can come into play. You know, and not to you know bring bring down doom on everybody, but that's that's the nature of things. Um, how many coyotes um, rest in areas? Like a square mile? Could there be like 20 coyotes, 30 coyotes? Do you have an idea how many coyotes would be in Paradise Valley? Yeah. It it depends on what's available for food sources. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and and, and 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 there's a lot of variables to that and stuff. Though, I mean, there could be an area you know that's got a lot of rabbits. You know, a lot of a lot of food for rabbits or ground squirrels, things like that to eat. But then when you add the human component, if people, you know, if there's cat food that's left out or dog food or other, you know, food sources, whether it's um, nuts or seeds that are dropping off your plants and and things like that, that can certainly add to it as well. So it's, I mean, it, it's very fluid. You know, the coyote populations go up and down; they move in and out. You know, so kind of a lot of it kind of depends on what's there. So I just wanted to give you a perspective. Sure. Um, I've lived in Paradise Valley since 1994. Okay. Um, and in the last two years, I've seen 12 coyote pups born on the golf course, six more born right in the culvert right off the golf course. The golf course was closed. There was no reason you know, for them to run away. Now it's I have artificial grass. I have a super soaker. I do 50-50. Um, there's no water source on my property. My backyard has 
basically no bunnies because I have big dogs that like bunnies. Right. Um, and my neighbor has one of those fences mm -hmm. with the roller. The coyotes go right up and over it. There's absolutely no hesitation on that part. The problem is that if I had the grasses and weeds on my property that are now in the golf course, I would get excited by the town of Paradise Valley. But I drive down at 11.30 on the way to the store in the afternoon in the morning, and the coyotes are walking across the road and going right into that golf course with the golfers right on the course. But they can get in that brush, and there's no downside for them. Well, you know, and that's what we're talking about. You know, I'm I'm not going to tell you know the golf course how or any. I'm not going to tell you how to how to manage your your plants and things like this. Okay, there's I can make suggestions and there's ways to minimize it and stuff. So, it, my dealings in the past with golf courses is they like coyotes because what what eats their grass and their turf, the, the rabbits and stuff. So, you know, so it you know I, I don't know I I, I guess I'm at a loss because I. I, I at 11 o'clock at night is running down the street screaming at the top of my lungs at my and I can vouch for her. <laughs> and, and you know, I'm out there and I can look out my front window at 4.30 in the afternoon on Sunday afternoon and they're standing this close to my window in my walled courtyard. Have you hit them with the moan yet? I've gotten close, oh. but unfortunately, okay. you know, I usually have a dog right behind them, and I yeah. think dogs have gotten it. Well, I was hoping you were, were going to tell me that 50 50 didn't work, because I was going to, oh, crap, back to the drawing board. Well, it you makes know. me absolutely right. sick when I'm spraying it, but, you know, I mean, I hit my dog from the air chasing the coyotes out of the yard, too, but, you yeah. know, they're still there every single day in my yard. Hmm. What's, what's in your yard? Um, it's a pass through. There used oh. to be, and they pass right through. That was going to be my next question. What's on the other side of your yard? Is yard. The, they're, but, they're going through there for okay. some other reason. Oh, right. <laughs> but okay. it's just, I mean, it's their path now. And they come around and they come off the golf course. They come through the neighborhoods. They come through my yard, go out, and go back right on the golf course. Chris, sounds like a good place to trap, right? It does. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I understand, except though that, you know, there, there are those issues. And, you know, there's one other thing, and, and if anyone can figure this out and stuff, though, they make these motion-activated sprinkler heads. They work very well in the winter time to just dis to dis dis discourage um, wildlife, you know, animals that don't want to be wet because it's cold out. Okay, mm -hmm. if someone can figure out how to get um, diluted ammonia in line, I know you've seen those, you know, like the, the, they spray the weeds with this stuff like this, but the nozzle's not the same, so that might be, you know, an opportunity for, you know, you don't even have to be there. You know what I mean? You know, keep you know that they come through and they get sprayed with that, and then might be an option. So, I'm sorry, this gentleman. I was curious. Uh, it might be more for the police department, but um, super soakers are nice, uh, non-lethal. Now, I'm not suggesting that lethal's uh, obviously going to be legal, but is there another power level up that's possible? A paintball gun, a slingshot, something that maybe uh, more than a 20 foot range to maybe get the idea. Hey, you need to go somewhere else. Right. Well, this this model shoots 20 feet. There's ones that shoot 40 feet or better. Yeah. You know, and you can make your own high-powered, you know, air-injected squirt gun. Like this. I'm not familiar with the town ordinances. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Projectile. The town ordinance says that um, you cannot throw, um, you cannot shoot an arrow, you cannot discharge a weapon. There's a town ordinance, but there's also a state statute that if you discharge a weapon within the town of Paradise Valley. It's a class six felony. So um, the one for the arrow, uh, as long as it stays on your yard, you're safe. But as soon as it leaves your yard, whether you miss the coyote, um, it ricochets off the ground, or it leaves that boundary that's your property, now your name's on it. So now you could be cited and charged under that town ordinance. I, I actually mentioned earlier, I mentioned a paintball gun or slingshot, something like that. Like. Uh, paintball gun. Um, yeah. There's no town ordinance against a paintball gun, but it's still discharging a weapon because there's still force behind it. So it's the same exact thing. Yes, sir. For me or game and fish? I just want, I, I came here with one thing in mind. We're going to talk about the golf course. I've heard enough about coyotes up to this point. Okay. Um, the only it's thing not only about. I got seven of them in a coat. 
<laughs> now, let's, let's get at the meat of the situation. Is, are they stonewalling us over here at the hotel? And their lawyers are going to outlast our lawyers? What's, what's, what's happening? All right, sir, we'll, uh, okay. we'll deal with your question a little later. Is there any other questions for these gentlemen from Damon Fish? I said, oh, let's go. Um, we happen to be in an area that's a pathway, vacant land, so we have lots of coyotes we have every night. What I've just learned, and I'm sure this is true maybe in various parts, is that what they've termed, the landscape has termed a killing field. So this is where the coyotes go every night because the people that live at this house are there maybe one or two times, three times a year maybe, so they know it's a vacant backyard that they can just go on to this turf area and I guess they do their killings. Is there something that we can do then, if we're, once we find these little killing fields, to deter, it's, well, first of all, does it help to deter, or is it a good place if we're killing them just in this area? Or do we put some ammonia or something around there so that breaks up their killing area and then build it or something to do it? I don't know, <laughs> but I do now know like where they're taking it. No, um, does it help to get rid of those places? Probably not. If, if it's if it's if this is in an area that's that, that's not bothering people, you know. And, and it's not. So it's a person's beautiful home who's not there, so they're just jumping at wall and going down. Yeah, and, and I've never really heard of like a killing field. I mean, you, are you yeah, talking? The okay, have you, are, you, are you talking about hearing like a lot of noise coming? No, from the there? landscaper found our puppy's collar, and okay. I know that the dog was not killed there because. We were right there. Right. So, but two weeks later, she found it. She brought it to me because it had her number, and she said every week she takes purposes away from this area. Okay. So we and she called it the killing field. So I know this is not unusual. It's right. probably happening throughout the house. But hearing what you have to say, I'm wondering if we displace this area, does it help, or does it hurt? What you're probably dealing with, and there's 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 a couple things. Um, with, within a given within a coyote's given territory, there's probably a dozen or places, dozen or more places where they can go and feel safe, bed down for the day, and all this stuff. Though, so certainly, and we've seen this a lot with bobcats, um, finding a home that you know is from a you know part of your resident or something, it's raising their pups there. So the, it could be an area with that has you know water source. Nobody bothers them. You know where where the, where their pups can be safe from other coyotes or other predators. You know there's fenced in walls, the pups can't get out, you know, so not, mom's not chasing pups around, and likelihood is they're bringing food back for young to eat there and stuff though, or, you know, even just for the rest of the pack where no one's going to bother them. Unless there's like a large amount of food there, you know, like a lot of rabbits and things like this, may not, wouldn't be necessarily yeah, called. they're bringing in their food. Right. So, so again, it's just a, a, a comfort level where they know no one's going to bother them. They can, they can eat in peace. Um, so, my suggestion would probably be not to disturb that, you know, I mean, but it really wouldn't make a whole lot of difference. They'll just find another place to do that. So, okay. I'm oh, sorry, and again, question. I think many people here just want you to be aware that especially how bad the situation is mm -hmm. with the change in the golf course and the leader leads the site up to our back. There's kind of this everywhere. I've lived here 30 years. I've lived in the home for 15 years. I've never seen anything in the future. Mm -hmm. The behavior. I have them surround me before I've been walking like And I do all the things you said. But it's not it's so bad. I don't think you get what's going on So I just want you to know that this is a very good thing. I've lived here a long time and never seen it. Well, I, you know, I do understand, and we, we've dealt with some issues, uh, Cordobella or something up there, one of, one of the um, condo associations up there. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and I think this could just be an anomaly with what happened with the golf course. So I'm saying there, there was changes, okay, golf course was dirt and stuff, though, the rabbits had to go somewhere, you know, and then... Right, well, no, no, now it, now it's changed, now the golf course is back, there's green grass out there and stuff like this, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Well, again, that's not something I can directly address. I, I'm not. I'm not a policy maker. Right. Okay. Okay.
where, well, let me just kind of put it in perspective. Um, and I think if we, if we get involved as an agency, okay, we come in there, our policies state that we are going to react when there's a report of aggressive behavior towards people. Okay, and when that happens, we're killing coyotes. We're not, unless, unless you can tell me that a coyote was missing a tail and, and missing an ear or something like this, we are sending in the hired guns to come in and kill coyotes, okay? If we go against our own policies, we are subject to litigation from people like Earth First and Defenders of Wildlife, all of these agencies that we're under a microscope when we do this. Unfortunately, to be proactive and do removals, well, well, although that sounds great, it doesn't affect things long term. Okay, coyotes are there for a reason. The coyote, the coyote behavior is because of, of of a number of factors. Golf course problem, but likely being one of them. Okay, if we increase the prey base, you're going to have more coyotes. Okay, but coyotes and a large number of coyotes is going to affect the prey base. What I'm asking is that we don't add to that by adding, by, by keeping our pets safe, by not adding another food source, okay? So that it is more of a natural environment. Coyotes will affect that prey base, and when there's less rabbits and less rodents and things for them to eat, they're gonna push them out, okay? So this, these things do go up and down, okay? So, and I am aware of it, okay. Did, um, excuse me if I'm wrong, but didn't you say that removing a coyote doesn't solve the problem? It, it, well, it removes that coyote. It removes the problem. It removes that coyote. Right. It doesn't remove the problem because of that territorial nature. It depends on what the problem is. Well, an aggressive coyote, seven coyotes in this lady's yard. And who's to say that? Them, you right. Kill three of them, five of them, whatever. Okay. Other coyotes are going to go because the attraction is still there. Right. The cover is still there. The, all the stuff, right. the rabbits are still there. Killing coyotes is, is a temporary fix. You know, it, it'll be, you know, what, if, whether we got the aggressive animal or aggressive animals and stuff, though, who knows? You know, Have you like, ever looked at a spay and neuter program, like a TNR, anything like that? Um, and we haven't seen the research done on that and stuff, though, and it's, you know, again, you're dealing with the same number of coyotes, okay? You're de okay, if you're dealing with a territorial coyote or coyotes, you know, you whether they're able to breed or not, you're dealing with a problem for seven or eight years at least. But okay. if they can't breed, don't the numbers go down? Well, you may have other breeding animals out compete those animals and push them out of a given territory. If if it's a good territory, there's competition for it. If there's good food there, other coyotes want to come in there. That's why they have those other coyotes to keep other coyotes out. Okay. Right, but the What's fact that it's spayed or neutered doesn't remove the coyote and doesn't push necessarily out. But it may change that animal's behavior. But it okay. may not. Um, <laughs> Isn't it like a feral cat? They're territorial. When you take feral cats out of their neighborhood, more are vacuumed in. A feral community that's spayed and neutered will actually keep the other feral cats. So you can have 20 feral cats. You spay and neuter them. They will not accept any other outside ferals. The colony is stays that finite mm -hmm. and you don't have this vacuum. Right now we have this huge vacuum because we have pups like 16 at a time right. being born and they're and they're now breeding and they're now breeding. But, but you're they dealing accept with... themselves because they're a pack. Well they're not producing well these aren't true packs though. These aren't animals that are together just because. These are family units. Okay? And there's a social structure. And that social structure is based on the behavior of those animals. Okay, how many dog? How many people have dogs that are non-neutered? Okay, you, I have two, and they, it, it's a it's a pissing contest. Okay, you know, and, okay. I was, you know, I'll, but anyway, <laughs> um, it's irresponsible. My dogs are in my yard. My dogs are not out of my control. Um, uh, and I was, my vet actually recommended that my adult male lab uh, not get new here. They're, they're, they're going to be on the chopping block, don't worry. But it, he's just now two years old. Without that testosterone, they, they, they're smaller, there's more potentials for hip dysplasia and all of other problems. What I was told. Okay, this is, okay, so this is, I'm going by a vet. Okay, but we're talking, I know, I know, okay. But we're talking about 
testosterone, we're talking about aggressive animals. We're talking about aggressive males holding that territory. Okay? I don't know that, that's, that, that that is true or not. Okay? My guess, or, or based on my experience, is that you mess with the, the behavior. Because why do you, why do you neuter an animal for, to lower the aggression in some cases, you know, other than population control? Okay? Right. But you change that behavior of that animal, that animal can be dethroned, so to speak, is my guess, is my thinking. Okay? So, so I, you know, it's, it's possible, and there may be some, you know, if you want to do research on this, I, it might be an idea. Um, I was going to say, I feel like you're bearing the brunt of the problem that you can't solve. So I apologize for that. I don't know if you want to talk about that. But uh, we, we used to have done the golf course for 15 years. Not as much as you have. Oh, sorry. 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 Is, this, is this a question? Yes, it's a question. Well, it, a compliment and yeah, a question. I, okay. I, and then, yeah, because I really just want to hold it. No, I understand. Got it. Um, so, I, I like to be informed, and you've informed me, and I appreciate that, because now, now I understand that you're not the solution to what, to the problem that I think many of us came here to try to solve, so that's great. Um, I do have a question, though. We, we live on the golf course, obviously, and we, when you said that they're not nocturnal, the coyotes, uh, I also know how to say coyotes now, because I used to say coyotes, but I guess that's always um, So, uh, we see them during the day, um, but we hear them at night. Not every night, but many, many nights. And they're howling, and they wake us up, and it's it's crazy. I mean, we get out of bed and go to the door and just open the door and just are amazed by what we hear going on out there. And this is a new problem. Now, I'm not saying we never heard it before. For 15 years, did we hear it? Absolutely. But we hear it on a regular basis now. And I don't think you guys are the solution to it. I compliment you for what you've done here. I'm very informed now about all of this. I think we have techniques. I think that's great that we can use. But but I don't think you're going to eradicate this problem by setting traps and you know residents arming themselves with you know whatever you call them super soakers, squirt guns, um, all that stuff. So. Um, I think a lot of us came to, to hear about the golf course, which we think has changed, right. changed in a way that has you know, created a problem that wasn't there. So that's, that's good to say. Yeah, yeah. Darren, Darren and Curtis, thank you so much for spending the whole time. I'm sure everybody took a lot of what you said. This is a great education for, for everybody, including myself. I have coyotes and in my area, but uh, thank you for spending the time. So. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. One last thing. Uh, if you mind making sure the town gets a copy of that presentation so we can post that on our you website. Bet. That was a lot more in depth than anything. Okay, you bet. Um, as far as nocturnal goes, they are they will be active at night. They're truly nocturnal animals, we're talking like raccoons, and things like that. They're all the active. Most most active at dawn and dusk, but can be active. Okay, we're just going to continue on here. Um, I just want to let everybody know that we do have two private companies uh, that are here with us tonight. Um, if you have any questions, if you would like to hire them, possibly, for example, in your killing killing field uh, scenario. Uh, no, I'm just saying that's that's why you would hire one of these companies. Um, they have a lot of great information, and they'll be able to uh, give you whatever you need, and if you need their services, they'll be obviously happy to do so. Just so you know, also, this uh, meeting is being recorded. It will be on our website tomorrow. If you forgot something, if you're not sure, it will be on our website. Um, now I'd like to turn the mic over to uh, Vice Mayor Collins uh, for a few words. All right, thank you, Officer Albert. Can we get a round of applause for Officer Albert? For Okay, and as you mentioned, we do have some representatives from critic control and some active control measures here in the back. And so if any of you want to talk to them uh, while I speak, uh, feel free to get up and go. Uh, let me uh, just, first of all, uh, see by a show of hands uh, how many people in here feel that education and outreach um, is the only solution that the town should recommend. 
Absolutely. So there are a few. And how many in here feel that the town should be engaged in finding a solution that's uh, that has more active control? Okay. And then how? And then last question. I promise, and then, then I'll speak. Um, how many in here live around the golf course and are concerned about that specific problem? Okay, thank you. About the same number as the ones interested in the active control, just as a note. Um, before I began, I have to kind of say some housekeeping items. Uh, Mayor Lamar was here and then he left, but we have a quorum of the town council here. And so procedurally, um, we can't debate or discuss exactly what uh, solutions we're going to propose or conduct in the future. That would be a violation of open meeting law. Um, so what I will do tonight is just tell you what my perspective is. And uh, I know many of you, uh, talk with many of you during the public safety task force process and, uh, and also in touring the uh, golf course community with Brad um, and identifying some of the problems. And, and as you know, the issue of wildlife um, came to be because of all of you were speaking out uh, and speaking out that you had identified a localized problem that should be addressed by the town. Now, I'll give you my background and as some of you know, I had a dachshund, a 10-year-old uh, dachshund who was killed in my backyard uh, in front of my wife and it was the most traumatizing thing I think that uh, she'd ever uh, experienced. Absolutely right. That was a little over 10 years ago. So I didn't know. I didn't know that coyotes can jump my six foot block wall in the back of my yard. I didn't know that turning our little dog out in the middle of the afternoon was a risk to him. Um, I just didn't know. Um, since that happened, I took it upon myself to plant tall bushes along the back of my wall. I planted or I installed pigeon spikes where there was a gap in the bushes and I got a bigger dog. And uh, the, I thought I had found the solution. Well, about three years ago, our other little dog, who was a replacement for the first little dog, uh, was behind a fence and the big dog was barking and the coyotes jumped the wall again and attacked the little dog. He didn't die, but he suffered a lot of, a lot of damage. And so, um, when I look at the problem, I think about myself. I, I'm probably not going to install leg traps in my, on my property for the sake of my dogs. And I probably don't have anywhere near my property where I can install leg traps. Um, so active control is probably not a solution for me. And I think that there are many residents in the town, we've heard from many, that uh, appreciate the value of wildlife in our community and enjoy seeing the native wildlife around. And I think we can all appreciate a certain level of wildlife through our town. Where it becomes beyond normal or atypical is when you start to see a localized problem. And I think that's what many of you have experienced and what we've started to hear from you around the Ambiente Golf Course in that there seems to be a perception that there are uh, an abnormal number of coyotes. Um, and perception is 99% of reality, right? So um, I think that the, the way that our town has handled this uh, to date is to, is to look at it from two levels. One, that it's a town-wide concern. And, and as, as many of you know, we haven't, uh, our town has not had an active urban wildlife program since 2008. And so now we've started to, uh, we reinstituted that program. Uh, Officer Albert is the tip of the spear for the town on that. Um, and we plan to conduct ongoing education outreach events uh, throughout the year. I think the next one, Officer Albert, is June. It will be uh, end of June, beginning of July. Yes. End of June, beginning of July. Okay, so that's the baseline, right? That's the education and information that we all need to live with wildlife, regardless of whether we're in a hot spot or an area of specific concern. Um, I also think that, and again, I'm giving you my perspective. I, I can't tell you what we're going to do yet. But I also think that we have an obligation to work with residents to do things where they're where the town can do something. And, and, and Jeff paid a good compliment to uh, Darren and Curtis uh, about their presentation here tonight and suggested that they uh, weren't necessarily a part of the solution. I disagree a little bit. I know that uh, Curtis probably won't be able to respond. Uh, you'd have to dock his boat on Saguaro Lake and come and get in his Jeep and, and come over here and respond. You know, that might not be the way that they are part of the solution, okay? There are other ways. I think we as a community, we're a pretty bright, intelligent, educated, sophisticated, never wrong community, right? We expect that the, the, our town engages problems 
in a rational, intelligent manner, educated manner. And so I think that's that's the next step. You asked a question about the Ambiente the Golf Course. I think we have identified that there is a potential problem localized in that area. And there might, might be other areas. I think we have residents who live near the Ritz-Carlton parcel at uh, Lincoln and McDonald, same thing, you know, dens and packs of coyotes out there. So there might, there might be other localized areas of abnormal population or specific concern. And I think it's the town's obligation to take the next step to find out what we can do. And so what I would like to see, and, I, and, and what, I, what I will be proposing, and I hope that my, uh, my peers agree with me, is that we open up a better dialogue with Game and Fish. Game and Fish um, have, granted their resources have been curtailed significantly due to budgetary constraints, but they also do have research biologists, and they have others who can come and think through a problem, try to understand what the actual problem is. You know, we don't know the population dynamics of the coyotes living on the golf course. We do know that the vegetation structure, I think it was in one of one of, Darren's, one of Darren's slides, that tall bushes and grass hide coyotes and creates that improved habitat. Um, we are in conversation with Marriott Corporation. They have acknowledged that they feel that the vegetation that is in many of your backyards um, is not to the Marriott standard that they would like. And uh, I think that you've seen in recent uh, newspapers that they have hired a horticultural, two horticulturalists to help them in that problem. I have not heard back yet. I think they're still pending with, to find out what that solution is. But I think they will probably come back and make a recommendation that deals with the aesthetics of that vegetation in addition to its uh, contribution to what might be uh, uh, nice habitat for coyotes to, uh, to, to prey and to, and to hide in. And so I think we'll find solutions from Marriott towards that end, and I think in, in my experience, and Councilmember Scherf and I have, have uh, talked with the, the general manager of Marriott several times, they're engaged and they're looking for a solution as well. But this, their solution, along with the town, is not going to kill every coyote in the town. That, that can't be the solution, and, and, and I don't think that there's popular support for that. But there can be solutions that are localized, and so what I would uh, hope that, that we do, and I would encourage you to, to Officer Albert has, has his cards up there on the table. For those of you who may not live near the Ambiente Golf Course, but think that you also live in an area of localized problem, uh, to contact him. Because what I, what I would foresee is that when Officer Albert says, you know, we have an area, we might have a problem, let's work with Game and Fish to see what we can do in that localized area. Um, the, the, the council has made funding available both this year and projected next year for exactly this type of thing. Officer Albert, if he, if he works with Game and Fish, and they say, okay, let's, we need to know how many coyotes are in the area. I mean, it's not, it's not that hard to put up you know, motion detecting cameras around the lake on the golf course. Um, we can do things to find out what the extent of the problem is. And then once we find out and validate that there is a problem, and I don't think any of us are, are second guessing any of you in, in your perception that there is a problem, but it's easier to come up with a treatment and a solution once you validate or um, quantify exactly what the situation is and exactly where the best solutions may lay. So I think you'll see the next step being a combination of Marriott working to modify their vegetation structure in the outer rough areas on your property. I think that Officer Albert will be working with Game and Fish to see if there is some type of localized um, data collection effort or further study that they can that, that they can use to propose a solution. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, trapping and extermination of coyotes on private property uh, is legal. You know, we have representatives here that, that we can talk to about that. But I don't know many of you who are going to put lake traps in your backyards. I don't know that Marriott is, is too interested in putting open lake traps on a golf course. So there are challenges. Um, I don't think anyone is, is, is advocating the responsibility, um, but it's a, it's a complicated problem, complicated scenario. Um, we recognize that we need to find solutions, and I think the town is engaged in finding those solutions. Okay, I'll take a couple of questions. I don't live on the golf course. My name is Paul Jackson, and I live on Fanpool Drive. 
and our house backs up to Burnell Road, which is where the Burnell Wash is. It comes down uh, from the uh, from, from the from the preserve area, and it is a coyote highway uh, that runs into Paradise Valley from the preserve. And I would just suggest that that would be an area that you look at. We've lost two dogs, and I know my neighbors all have lost cats and dogs. I'm sorry, you're for your loss. Um, as I said, I've lived here a long time, and we work with um, Mr. Joe Jonquin, who was with Fish, jo yeah, with Fish and Game, and we had five coyotes. They attacked five oxen in the backyard, um, and it wasn't until they killed a dog five feet from a bus stop with kids that Fish and Game came in. They did like trap um, and took those out. And then, I mean, we're used to the coyotes. That's why I know all the things I'm supposed to do. That's why. But when I can't even be in my house at night without hearing small dogs screaming, which is why I'm out at 11 o'clock at night chasing. I take two boards, two by fours, and smack them together. And it startles them, or I scream at the top of my lungs, and they seem to take off a little, unfortunately, back to the golf course. But I mean, it's horrible to be living where you're listening to dogs being killed almost every night. And these are my neighbor's dogs. The lady on the corner, she moved out because all of her roommates' dogs were getting killed. Thank you, thank you for sharing. I, I would say that, that if any of you um, have ideas or think that there are specific areas where there are opportunities to take more uh, active control, to, to pass those on to Officer Albert. And, and he's kind of the collector of that um, um, for the, on, on the council's perspective, and, and we, will take, we will take a look at that. Bill? Yeah, may I risk saying something? <laughs> <laughs> I've lived here for about 30 years in Paradise Valley, and I love Paradise Valley. I've served on the visioning committee here uh, when we did the general plan. We want dark skies. We want open areas. We want the, uh, the desert. I love the desert, and I love the howling of the coyotes. I'm here, that's why I live here. I live here in the desert because of all of the things we're talking about. It's wildlife. And um, if you're going to spend our money, or some of my money, my tax money, on a golf course for coyote to, to we're trying to rid ourselves of coyotes, which I think is impossible. And then um, I'd like to I back up to to Mummy Mountain, and I want some money, you know, for me. Okay. I think what we're I and I think your problem with the golf course is your problem. You bought on the golf course. You got it. Okay. And and have fun with it. That's good. But I don't like the golf course. I won't live on the golf course. I like the dark skies and I like my desert. So. All right. Thanks, Bill. There's that. That's my state. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Jeff. <laughs> I thought I was just going to respect. I feel like on you. Well, well, you disagree. You disagree with me, and I was going to respectfully disagree with you, but now I'm going to also respectfully disagree with him. Um, by show of hands, how many here who came to talk about the golf the golf course? think they would be sitting in this room if the golf course had not been renovated? Question, one more, let me be more clear. How many, by show of hands, how many of you who are here to talk about the golf course think they would be in this room tonight if the golf course had not been renovated? Would anybody be here? No. no. Okay. That's why when you said the problem is complicated, I actually think it's simple. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. I'll, okay, just a couple more. Sir, you've been very patient, and I, I promise to come back and address your question head on. You've been doing this rhetoric all night long. What would you like me to say? My name's Little Boy. I lived here 25 years on the golf course. I like it. I like Paradise Valley. Nothing wrong with it. I like the people. But when you have to start doing studies with my money to go and redo your golf course that they turn weeds. We used to haul, haul weeds out of our cornfield that were worse than that, were better than that. I was born and raised on a farm. When they start giving me all this study crap, let me tell you something. I can take a John Deere tractor and a vine beater and be over this in two days in the entire <laughs> Get rid of the crap. That's all. <laughs> and uh, um, 
Le Boy? Yes. Le Boy, thank you. I think you will see Marriott take action soon if they have not no, already. No, what they're doing, they're playing the oldest game in the world. My attorney's going to outweigh your attorneys, and we don't have enough money to fight them forever. And they can go on forever because they're multi-billionaires for 56. We can't fight them. We know it. And they know it. How do you think we did in business? We did the same thing on a smaller scale. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, boy. I, I, I do have to say, um, I, I also appreciate your patience. And I know patience is wearing thin. I got, I got it. I understand that. Um, I, I, I want to recognize Brad Forrest here. Many of you uh, have been uh, uh, communicating through or, or getting information from Brad. You know, Brad and I have been working together for quite some time now. And I know that you don't like studies, the boy. Well, I, my firm donated a $30,000 study to fix your vegetation problem around the golf course. Studies are important. They're only bigger now. St studies provide the, the legitimacy to take action sometimes. The, this town is not about to take action uh, uh, as a knee-jerk reaction, right? And, and run the risk of doing something well, that's the wrong thing. running the whole deal? I'm confident at the end of the day, Marriott will come around and, and make right with that. the vegetation structure in the rough around the golf course. I, I, I wish I could convince you, I, I wish I could tell you the words. I've been in the meetings, I know the direction that they're going, I think we're going to see positive results uh, in the very near future. I'm sorry? I don't have an answer for that. But I know that the well, studies have been done the boy on the vegetation. We know what's out there. And so that study enabled Marriott to hire their guys to come in and find solutions. Okay? Why was it allowed? I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to the coyote thing. I think coyotes are going to be here one way or another. But this eyesore of a golf course we allowed into our community, I've had, when you used to have an ordinance control guy running around town, Stick a label on my door, write me a note that you have a, a weed that's taller than six inches, I believe, is the ordinance. Why was this eyesore allowed? Why, why is it even being discussed? Why aren't they cited to remove the things that I had removed from my yard? You can tell me that that's, those aren't weeds. They're weeds, dude. Those are weeds. Okay. If they were in your yard, they're weeds. Yes, but not at the very eye. Right. Um, I would just ask you to be a little bit more patient and stay involved, okay? stay engaged, communicate, communicate, communicate. Pay attention to what's going on, hold your town, hold your elected officials responsible and accountable for finding solutions. That's that's what I can say. Stay with it, little boy. Stay on our case, right? And, damn if, right? and if you don't see it, well then shame on us. But I'm confident, sir, I'm confident that we are making progress and we will address this. Can I ask we'll that the town council do something? In the, um, Paradise Valley Independent, would each of you just write your position? Like, I'm in favor of not doing anything um, about the golf course coyote problem. I'm in favor of ridding the golf course coyote problem, which I think I like coyotes. I mean, you know, I don't like them killing my pets, but. I like the javelina in my yard. I like the raccoons in my yard. I don't have a problem with it. What I have a problem with is that everything that you're, they were saying that we should not do, the only thing I'm doing is having my pets in my yard, and I can't even go put my dogs out at night to go potty, even though they're big dogs, because they're going to get attacked. And so I just want to know where the each individual town council member sits on this so that I'm knowledgeable when I test my vote. Sure, and that's a great question. And I would encourage you to ask your newsman to ask that question. But you know that the, the you know, okay. there's never going to be a, a, a situation where there's no coyote. I know there's You're not You're never coyote. ever going to be able to put your dog in your backyard confidently again. It's not, it's not going to happen. But it went from being where I could walk my dog down the street and I go, oh, there's a coyote up there. And now we have a group of people that are in Okay, let me let me get just a couple more uh, of questions. I appreciate everyone's 
patients today, but also patients tonight. And, and I appreciate you uh, coming out in attendance. There were over 80 of us here tonight, um, which is a good first step, and it means uh, it means that uh, uh, your town council needs to get to work, ma'am. Um, what I am here for the coyotes. You know, quite honestly, what the, what the golf course looks like it aesthetically is not at all my issue. My issue is that for the last two years or so, and especially this last six months per year, we've seen an escalation in the issues with the way the coyotes behave with the humans and the pets, which I am hearing from other people here. I think, um, Officer Collins, something that we all need to think about with this is it's not just a coyote problem, I think. It's the specific coyotes that now are embedded in this environment. They have been, it's like we've got a pack of coyote delinquents that now <laughs> know that they can go after, they, they have no restraint anymore. They, they've crossed every barrier that ever existed for them. And so we have a sort of unusual, not just a number of coyotes, but the specific coyotes. They're smart, and they're gonna learn these behaviors if we've have, if we have allowed them to. However it occurred, we're in a situation my biggest fear with this is if we don't find some way to de-escalate this right now, we're going to have an attack on a child because if you look at any environment where this has occurred, where you have one of these attacks that become very aggressive, those are the situations where eventually somebody gets injured. And I don't want to see us coming back six months or a year from now saying, what did we not do that could have prevented this tragedy? That's my concern. And we need to all, as a community, I'll point fingers, not that anybody's trying to do that, but it's got to be a solution that addresses the issue of behavior with this pack, along with probably the environment that they're living in. But it's got to be a two-fold thing, or you're not going to get there. Yes, uh, thank you for that comment. And, and it, too, is our concern that we do the right thing and we get this right the first time. So I'll take two more questions. I agree with everything I'm hearing here, but there seems to have been a shift here focusing on the on golf course. I've seen this progression for a number of years now, long before they transformed that golf course. We live on the other golf course and I we see more and more packs of coyotes. Back in the day, just a few years ago, it was uh, you know, in the yard, it was back and forth to the other part up there at the time. But uh, I don't know if we need to shift so much focus on the other golf course, just this problem in general, just to change the behavior of that. Thank you. Uh, and two more questions. I've got one in the back and then Allison. My name is Cindy Strong, and I live on the golf course, and I've lived there for over 20 years. <clears throat> Whether you, some people seem to be uh, upset because they think it's an issue about people complaining about the aesthetics of the golf course. Um, I don't think it's just the aesthetics. I bought my house, um, moved to Paradise Valley when we moved here from California. I was very careful and looking for a place where I could have my property value. And to have a course that looks like I would never have bought a house, <clears throat> excuse me, where my view was weeds. And I don't want to drive through a community that looks like that. And it isn't just us, those of us who actually live on a golf course. I have neighbors that live across the street and down the street. They're not on this list because they're not considered um, to be directly affected, but they are. They have to drive through it. They have to bring their guests in it. Um, I had 200 pounds of sand removed from my pool. We had $30,000 uh, air conditioning units put in that we had to have revamped because when they were doing all that construction, it jammed them up and they all froze up. I incurred all those costs. Um, we have a big holiday event where we have people come on the, the 12th day of Christmas to our house, which for the first time in 18 years we didn't have because it looked horrible. And it was so disappointing because we have so many people we have to entertain outdoors. And there's no way I'm gonna bring people out there. Um, I think in part with the coyotes, I've never seen coyotes like that. And my house backs the golf course. In fact, my house is the house that everybody complains about, okay? That whole stretch of golf course on double tree, that's my life, okay? That looks horrible. Which, by the way, when you did the tour, I couldn't believe you skipped my house. I think I sent you an email. I'm like, I'm a house that everybody's complaining oh, I, about. I saw it. And you skipped my house. Okay. Anyway. So, Blame Brad. He created all this. It's really bad. And I think, and I could be wrong. I'm not an expert. 
But we used to complain about these little prairie dogs that were all over the golf course, okay, food source. When they made the changes and changed that environment on the golf course, it created a new habitat, not just for um, new, more aggressive coyote, and I think they're more aggressive because their food source is gone, and they're moved into the neighborhoods looking for food because what used to be there isn't there. But it also created these awful habitat for those gross toads, you know, that can also kill your pets. They did not account for the effect of the changes that they made. So whether you like the golf course or not, some of the problems you're having is directly related to that golf course. And Marriott should be responsible for some of the expense and the cost. So this Thursday, I'm having a meeting at my home, will not be forgotten, <laughs> with the Marriott attorneys, with Rob Bartley. And I talked to Nick on the phone today, and he was telling me who he went through. He said the very head attorney for the Marriott family, and that he talked with him, and he said, you should be seeing changes. Because the conversation I had with him was just one flat out, I'm done. I said, I don't want to have any more conversations. I want to go through this. I'll sell my house. This is, you know, it's just me, my husband, and my son. This house was supposed to be left to him. I'll find a new place, as opposed to fighting this battle, because it's really simple. You can't get somebody an answer back that says, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, when, and that weeds aren't weeds. Either you want to do the right thing, or you don't. Um, maybe they are about to change. At least from the conversation I had with Nick on the phone today, it seems like they are. They're bringing a slew of people over on Thursday. I'll find out. Um, I want to see some changes being made. And they're not just because people who live on the golf course want it to look a certain way. But it has affected overall the way you live and use your home, whether you're on that course or not. You know, they didn't take things into consideration that they should have. We live here. It's not home. It's been for over 20 years. Well, thank you very much for sharing. What was your first name? Stevie. Stevie, thank you, Stevie, for sharing. I think we can all agree uh, that the conditions on the ground today are less than desirable. Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's been my hope, and I think it's been Brad's hope, that the lawyers don't get involved yet, because when the lawyers get involved, then uh, just like the voice, they're gonna they're gonna outweigh. So what we're trying to do is is get some changes done before the attorneys get involved. And, and I think we're seeing progress. Uh, we're seeing movement. Um, I'm glad that um, even though the word came from an attorney, and I always question when words from, come from attorneys, but I'm glad that Nick supported the idea that, that, that positive things are, are happening. Um, we, we see that, um, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that you don't see it yet, um, but I think you will see it. And if you don't see it, I'm sure that you will let us know, right? And, and you have to. That's your obligation. Stay engaged. Um, stay participatory. We're all volunteers. I get paid zero. Council member Dem Balancher, we get paid zero. We're neighbors. I live on the golf course, too. I live over, over on Padre Golf Course, um, so I get it. Why um, people felt let down because it's a true statement where they said somebody made the comment about the stickers being put on your door. I didn't mind it. I didn't mind because you thought all of that was in an effort to keep property values high, keep your neighborhood looking a certain way, and weeds. Nobody could have weeds in their, their front yard or in their yard without hearing from somebody from the town of PB. So we felt let down when they were allowed to do that in our neighborhood where we live. Right. Thank you, Stevie. And, and I don't think, you, obviously, you're not alone in this room um, with that feeling. And um, I would uh, suggest that you're not alone uh, at the council either. Uh, let's see what the, what the result is. And I'll, I'll take just two more then. Okay, yes, ma'am. Well, I just wanna say, we're on the golf course also, and I have no problems with coyotes. I mean, I've lived here for 10 years in, in our home and walked the golf course. They've always been very skittish, that kind of thing. I don't really want to eradicate those coyotes, although there's a lot more. But one of the problems is, is that they created such a, a hunting field with all the weeds that are so close to our house. I mean, we would have been far better off if they would have just brought in 
river rock or something in, in landscape with, with bougainvillea or a lantana or any of the beautiful desert plants. But now, I mean, a, a coyote, I, I went out and saw a coyote right outside our fence. It was probably maybe six, seven feet. And I shook our iron fence. I threw rocks at it. I tried to be big. I yelled. And that coyote just turned around and looked at me and just went right back to, to hunting. I mean, it, it is far more aggressive behavior. Our dog was mauled at 4 o'clock in the morning. He's typically inside. He went out the doggy door because he hates those coyotes when they're yelling. And three of them jumped our fence and just ripped him to shreds. And we never had that problem before. But I think now they are so close to the boundaries. The weeds are so close that that's where they they hang. They used to go down to the pond, and they would kill off a, a goose or a duck, and we'd hear them all out there yelling and yipping over their prey and stuff. But there's nothing out in the center. Their hunting grounds are all now around the boundaries, right outside of our fences. So I, I you know, I don't I don't want the people to be confused about us wanting to kill off the coyotes. Right. right. I, I right. want the hunting grounds gone. Oh yeah, understood. And and I think that Marriott acknowledges that. They understand that there's a crossover between the the dissatisfaction with the aesthetic value of the tall rough areas in your backyards and its contribution to habitat for coyotes. Everyone gets that loud and clear. So I'm 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 pretty confident that we'll start to see some progress. Last question, Allison. I, I was just gonna say something to, to your point. From what I've heard tonight, I want to thank you for having this. Um, even though I know a lot of you came for the reason for the golf course, it was kind of put out there, it was the state of fish about coyotes. But I think they did give us some solutions, and it is a candidate. It's getting the ammonia in your shooters and being very aggressive back to the coyotes. So I think that we need to, since we're here tonight, we need to pass that word along to our neighbors and to everybody in PD that that may not be may not solve the problem, but it is part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And then on the golf course end, I think again, it sounds like there is a solution. Enough people made enough noise. The town council got a hold of Marriott. It sounds like if you were calling Marriott, they weren't doing anything. So thank you for the town council for making you know the noise loud enough that they could hear it. Because it sounds like they are listening. It just does take time. I'd like, to, I'd like to add one thing. Just, just strengthen that town as a budget and in a really bad year, 15 million, and in a really great year, 18, maybe up to 21 million. Um, the Marriott Corporation is a little bit bigger. They have a special use permit on that property. Um, we have to negotiate the deal. But who gave them that special okay. use? Oh, it was voted on. Everybody looked at it, and we had a ton of public meetings. And so, yeah, and we're, all guilty, we're, all guilty, we're all guilty of it. So uh, you can point finger, you want to point finger at the council, great. Right. But the reality is that the special use permit that everybody looked at, there were a ton of public meetings on that. Our solution for this is going to be negotiating with them. It is not going to be any other way. We cannot raise any other flag. That's the only way we can possibly get this done. Yeah, From a practical standpoint, we can't take our tractor out there. So hopefully they're working with us. I think they are working with us. Do it. I, know a lot of I think they are working with us very well. And from a practical standpoint, if anybody thinks that we have any other options outside of that, I don't think that that is really a good practical solution for all tiny little town and big billion dollar corporations. And we are working. I live on the Ambiente Golf Course as the council member. We really enjoy living there. We like it to look a little bit. All right, thank you, Councilmember Debo, and thank you all for coming tonight. I'd like to give uh, just a, a round of applause to Chief Bennett and Community Resource Officer Kevin Albert. Stay on these guys. Ben. His card's right over there. Stay on him. Let's, let's make sure we get a solution here. Thank you. Good night.